Firefly, a 2002-2003 science fiction TV show airing on Fox, with the 2005 feature film continuation, Serenity, is a Joss Whedon cult hit about a band of outcasts struggling to survive in a far future based on the Wild West. With a high disparity between upper and lower classes, colonialism in a post-racial context, and a doomed attempt to translate post-Civil War ex-Confederate social anxieties to a non-racist narrative structure. I'm thinking we'll rise again. Much has been made of the flawed anti-racist storytelling that just copies old racist tropes and doesn't really subvert them besides saying we're against slavery now and also white people can be slaves. It must have taken a dozen slaves a dozen days to get you into that get up. Of course, your daddy tells me it takes the space of a schoolboy's wink to get you out of it again. Are we supposed to like this guy? And of the attempts to illustrate the melding of American and Chinese cultures, that don't actually contain Chinese people or any relevant culture, past text lacking all context, and absurd swearing mangled by white actors. But little has been said about the portrayal of queerness on the show. Or to use the slang of the verse, it's slyness. You're not sly, are you? Because I got my boys. Sly? No. I lean toward women, folk. I don't care, I'm still free. You can't take the sky from me. Okay, let's just step around the fact that sly sounds more like a future slur than positive slang. It would probably be reclaimed. Slyness in the verse is roughly at the same level of queerness in Real World 2002 as would have been accepted on Fox. When Firefly came out, sodomy laws were still on the books in many states. It was actually illegal in several U.S. states to have gay sexual intercourse. You could go to prison and be labeled as a sex offender, a special category given to pedophiles, restricting their access to mainstream society. Slyness is featured on the show in moments of girl-on-girl -girl titillation, not receiving the full respect awarded to straight relationships, and male sly illusions are used for humorous absurdity at best and degrading transmisogyny at worst. While Mel denies being sly, Inara appears to be bisexual, maybe? As a companion, a revered upper-class sex worker modeled on the Western distorted perception of the geisha, she has training to service both men and women. It's implied that not every companion takes clients of both genders, making it notable that she does, but whether that indicates something about her sexual orientation or not is left ambiguous. In episode 6, Our Mrs. Reynolds, written by Joss Whedon, a criminal using the alias Saffron attempts to steal the ship by inserting herself among the crew in the guise of a hapless victim. She has the same training as Inara and uses it to seduce both Mal and Wash, so she can drug them into unconsciousness with a seal on her lips. <clears throat> when Inara catches her trying to steal a shuttle, she pulls the same move on Inara, who seems to go for it until the lie falls apart and both break character. The seduction in itself is framed with the same sweet intimacy, characteristic of most of the companion sexual scenes, which are usually straight, but with the added tension of the deception. Saffron comes across as an outrageous deceptive force. We bought into her falling for Mal, but that trust was betrayed. We're supposed to be shocked and repulsed by her treachery. When she corners Wash, it's framed with the tone of a predator stalking her prey. When Inara catches her and she pulls the same trick yet again, it has a tone of, What won't this vile Jezebel stoop to? Which doesn't lend a great subtext to the on-screen slyness. It's unclear whether or not either of them are really into it. Both play their roles, and then they stop and split ways. You're good. You're amazing. Who are you? Inara kisses Mel immediately afterward, as if to reaffirm her heterosexuality. And when we see Saffron again in episode 11, Trash, we learn that she makes a pattern out of marrying people and leaving them for dead, and that none of her other marks were female. It really does look like her attempted seduction of Inara was just an opportunistic use of her one main tool. The scene is also played for titillation to the straight male viewers, as are the other Saffron seduction scenes. 
Inara gets drugged by a residual knockout drug on Mal's lips when she kisses him, but pretends that she just fell to hide the impulsive kiss as part of the will they won't they relationship. When she reveals Saffron's seduction attempt at the crew, we get a shot of Mal reacting to the sapphic activity like he's blown away by how outrageously sexy it is. At the end of the episode, Mal figures out that Inara was also drugged, but mistakenly thinks that it's because she let Saffron kiss her and bounces away smug in his belief that Inara was equally as susceptible to Saffron's seduction as him, but also with the subtext that he as a straight man finds that super hot. This thematic subtext is made overt in episode 10, War Stories, written by Cheryl Kane, in which Inara actually does take a female client, an unnamed Persephone counselor. The reveal of this is treated like a sexy joke. The gender of the counselor isn't made clear. Mal talks to the wrong person. Turns out the counselor is a woman. Hilarious sexy. This time we get reaction shots from four different people. Mal is surprised and humbled. Christian priest book quietly judges her because he's a religious conservative. Cute tomboy Kaylee is surprised but finds them glamorous. And tough guy Jane just openly lusts after them. I'll be in my bunk. He does that later too. I'll be in my bunk. That became a really popular quote, by the way. A sleazy straight guy lusting after lesbians and referencing his intent to masturbate over them got put on t-shirts and countless other fan-made merchandise. Yeah. Kaylee's is the best reaction, but her positivity is minimized with Jane's ostentatious straight guy antics taking the focus. As for Inara's actual interaction with the counselor, it's performative in an exaggerated way to emphasize how unfamiliar she is with catering to a female client, even though the face she shows to male clients in other episodes lacks that exaggeration. They discuss the companion service as like a break from being around men, like a spa day with benefits. And Inara acts like she realizes she can be herself around her while slipping into the show she gives male clients. They kiss, and that's it. It's the closest thing to a positive depiction of slyness, and it's a weird stilted scene that somehow feels both too erotic, as for the male gaze, and too chaste, as for the Fox executive's gaze. Inara sees off the counselor with Jane leering. In the original script, there's a sequence where Inara goes to the counselor's house and finds her husband who knows nothing. I know nothing. Nothing. <laughs> The counselor has been sneaking off in secret, and this would have been a depiction of a lesbian in the closet. Perhaps that was too much for the Fox executives. Overall, it's not great lesbian representation, and it's at best a sign of better things to come that we never got because the show was canceled. That's not to say that the show is otherwise devoid of slyness. In a similar manner to Johnny Depp playing Captain Jack Sparrow as Super Bi in the Pirates of the Caribbean films, while never having any sign in canon that the character is actually bi, Mal's stoic straight man demeanor is broken up with a goofy secondary characterization as someone who acts sly but isn't actually. Specifically, he calls men pretty. We are so very pretty. Fanti's prettier and has a penchant for cross-dressing like Bugs Bunny. This comes up in his first appearance, in the first scene of the first episode, Serenity, written and directed by Joss Whedon. In the middle of the Battle of Space Gettysburg, Mal needs to improve morale, so he gives this impassioned tough guy speech with the punchline of calling everyone present pretty. Though Zoe, an actual woman, is there, the tight framing leads us to think that he specifically means himself and the scared guy that he's trying to encourage. Huh? Look at that chisel jaw. Huh? Come on. It's a very queer joke in its execution, mixing butch and femme aesthetic by describing men in this elegantly feminine way. Pretty. I'm sure that Whedon intended it as a feminist device to elevate femininity, but it ultimately just feeds into the hypermasculine culture that views this kind of display of, well, sissiness amid butchness as a hilarious non sequitur, rather than challenging the culture itself. There's a callback to this in the movie, written and directed by Joss Whedon, where when Mal is antagonized by identical twins who teasingly pretend to be each other, Mal calls out the deception and explains that he can tell because one is prettier than the other. 
In this case, the twins are metrosexual dudes as a means of distinguishing them as more urban and upper class, and the rough hewn, not confederate. The line comes across as Mal playing their game by acknowledging that they're trying to look somewhat feminine and asserting dominance like he might be interested and oh no, you don't want that. Similar to Deadpool's rape threat. Any offense this implication could cause is smoothed over by the one identified as prettier, giving his brother a look like he's thinking, he's right, I am prettier. Again, it doesn't challenge hypermasculinity as much as it plays with and ultimately affirms it. We see this again in Mal's cross-dressing antics. Our Mrs. Reynolds opens out of context with a bait wagon the crew set up to lure bandits. Jane poses as a humble pioneer with a wife whose face is hidden under a floral bonnet. The bandits accost them and their leader announces his intent to rape the wife. What starts with a serious tone shifts into humor as Jane claims that his wife is too ugly to rape. Cue the reveal that it's Mal as he and Jane goof around. Mal affecting a feminine voice. It could be a positive affirmation of queerness, but it's all muted by the frat boy antics downplaying the severity of rape and ultimately reinforcing gender roles by playing Mal's cross-dressing as inherently absurd and having him make a macho threat highlighting that juxtaposition. But if your hand touches metal, I swear by my pretty floor bonnet, I will end you. In the following scene, Mal gets a little tipsy and Inara points out that it seems like Mal chose to cross-dress specifically because he wanted to, not because it has any strategic value. And he indicates that she's right and he loves cross-dressing. Them soft cotton dresses feel kind of nice as a whole uh, airflow. Again, it could be used to deepen the character with queer aspects, but it's all dismissed as an absurd joke. Like woman, I am a mystery. <gasps> Mal indicates he's about to start a long story about how he got into cross-dressing, and Inara cuts him off because she's not that interested in his life. It's a setup for Mal being susceptible to Saffron's manipulation for her acting interested, but it also serves to communicate just how absurd and inconsequential Inara finds his interest in cross-dressing. His cross-dressing hobby also shows up in the movie where he infiltrates the companion training center, disguised as a woman under a tasseled shawl. There's a bit of physical comedy in the way he makes the tassels shake, and the absurdity is emphasized when he opposes the villainous operative in a macho standoff. In that outfit. I can be very graceful when I need to. I've no doubt. Our Mrs. Reynolds also ends with Mal identifying with a feminine gender role while overtly performing masculinity for an absurdist joke. After tracking down Saffron, the two of them fight in a rhythmic way that he associates with sex, and he humorously says something that the woman would typically say during a sex scene. It's the first time, darling. I think you should be gentle with me. He's so overtly macho here that no one would ever mistake that for an appreciation of femininity. It's just a joke. Something similar happens in the fourth episode, Shindig, written by Jane Espenson. Mal needs to solicit a specific client and he gives a physical description to Kaylee. Where's a red sash, cross brace. Why does he do that? Maybe you won the Miss Persephone pageant. Just help me look. Again, it derives humor from absurd association of feminine gender performance from men and with a distinctly negative tone. There's nothing of Mal putting out a joyful association with transgressing gender norms, just the implication that any man who does so would be worthy of derision. Of course, Joss Whedon has a long history of using cross-dressing and androgyny for absurdist humor, as is associated with his transphobia as a turf. Mal might come the closest to being a positive example of an androgynous character, but is ultimately shortchanged by Whedon's transphobic politics. And then there's Jane, one of Whedon's many characters with a name gendered in conflict with the character's gender. His shtick is that he's kind of a crude, manly man with a girly name. Presumably as a boy named Sue kind of thing. Jane is a girl's name. Well, Jane ain't a girl. I show her good and all. I got man parts. Aside from the name irony, nothing more queer is done with this character. Girl, that is just plain dirty. Jane, you are aware your radio's transmitting because I don't feel particularly girlish or dirty. Uh. All of these characters are probably intended as positive examples of queerness, challenging gender and sexual norms, but they're marred by existing homophobia of the writers and Fox executives. I honestly think that Whedon could have intended Mal to be some manner of gender fluid, but was hindered by his turf belief that actually going there would be anti-feminist. 
Firefly has its own slyness that is worthy of note, but it's mostly wasted potential. And that is a big damn shame. Ain't it just? Burn the land and boil the sea. You can't take the sky from me. There's no place I can be since I found serenity. You can't take the sky from me.